Good evening. Welcome to the Scola Academy Lecture Hall. Um, I see our numbers are kind of slowly ticking in here, so everyone is leaving the weight room and coming in. We apologize. We had a technical issue that put us on um, almost a 15-minute delay, but we're going to make sure we get right into the evening's plan and, and schedule. As you can see, we have Jessica Hooten Wilson with us tonight. I am very excited that she's with us. And in a moment, um, I'm going to, of course, introduce her um, and speak a little bit about her, just um, so everyone is familiar with her. If you haven't met her at conferences or read one of her books, she is a delight and a phenomenal woman. So I'm really excited to have her here with us. Um, as you're joining us, if you just want to kind of say hello and tell us where you're joining us from tonight. Um, tonight's audience usually is a mix of School A Academy families, educators, homeschooling parents, school administrators, friends of the speaker. We just kind of get a wide audience, which we're so grateful for that. Um, just real quickly, a history of School A Academy. We started in 2014. We are an educational service line within Classical Academic Press, uh, which is a publishing company that started in the early 2000s. Um, Gole Academy is um, a program fully online for students K-12. to Our classes are classical, restful, engaging, and um, personal in that sense where we um, foster uh, or we strive to foster re relationships between instructors and students in small classes. Our school A philosophy is uh, contemplative learning is what we value. So time to study what is most important, dive deep, um, and hopefully um, teach in a way that helps our children learn in a less frenetic classroom, frenetic experience. And so we walk alongside homeschooling parents to do that. Um, and we also support families with our tutoring center and our center for students with learning differences. Uh, we are also an ecumenical school, which is unique. Um, we have three houses of studies, one in the Anglican tradition, Catholic tradition, and orthodoxy. So we um, take that from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, this idea where we walk into the Great Hall and there are rooms off of the hall, and uh, we share common um, tradition, common beliefs, um, as the Nicene Creed um, has for us, and that's where we as Christians come together, um, but also the revival of classical Christian education uh, brings in all families from a variety of Christian traditions, and so we want, and we also have non-Christian families, and so we welcome everyone um, and then these houses give families opportunities if they want to dive deeper into a specific Christian tradition to study church history, music, um, liturgy, all kinds of really beautiful things um, that help us live our um, respective faith traditions. So um, with that, I'm going to introduce formally here uh, Jessica Hooten Wilson. She has her PhD from Baylor University. She is the inaugural visiting scholar of liberal arts at Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. She's taught at the University of Dallas. Um, she's the author of many great books. Um, I was just telling her this one finally came into my hands tonight. So I'm really excited about that. But she's also the author of The Scandal of Holiness, Giving the Devil His Due, Demonic Authority in the Fiction of Flannery O'Connor, um, a book on Dostoevsky which received uh, the 2018 Christianity Today Book of the Year Award. Um, and she's written two books on Walker Percy. She's the co-editor of Learning the Good Life. Um, she speaks on a variety of topics, Russian novelists, Catholic thinkers, and Christian ways of reading, which is where tonight's topic will lead us. So without further ado, I'm going to say welcome, Jessica, and hand the floor to you. Thank you so much. I am excited to be here. I really apologize. The technology was acting up on my side of things. And so I hate that I missed that time. But thank you for everyone who stuck through the waiting to get here. I really appreciate it. 
And I do want to still observe time for Q&A. I feel like it's really important. The entire point of my book is that reading is more of a conversation than anything. And I know as Scully learners, you understand the necessity of conversation for being part of the learning experience. And so I, I want to respect that. So hopefully we will have the last 15 minutes or so to, to get to talk about anything in your reading life. So if you want to go ahead and start putting chat questions, not only just inspired by what I say, but just you've probably run into questions about how do you find time to read? What are the great books? Um, how could reading be a spiritual practice? What does this look like? Is there a difference between school reading and church reading? Is there a difference between literature and the Bible? There's a lot of these big questions that I think people have, and this is probably the space to invite those now. So go ahead and start adding those to the chat as we go through. I am excited about this book. Today's the official book launch day. And so my excitement is rather high because today is the book that the day that the book meets hands of readers and getting to see their responses. And so it's an exciting day for me. This book has come out of my teaching life. I began teaching um, about 20 years ago and I went into the classroom rather naively excited about sharing the joy of literature with all of my students. And then I realized that so many students, and you have to remember, I started at classical schools. So I taught elementary, junior high, high school. So this was across the board before I even got into the college classroom and then graduate classroom. And I found the same thing to be true across ages, that people would come with this baggage against literature that they probably didn't have when they were younger, when they were you know, five or six and first learning the joy of reading and how it opened their eyes into new worlds. And this excitement and enchantment that discovered with reading or poetry and the fun of it and the love of rhymes and memorizing it and sharing those rhymes with others and making up new rhymes and all of those things that I had managed to keep all the way through my 20s, everyone had lost. All my students had lost it. And instead they came up with hangups regarding, I need the right answer or I don't know what this means. I'm no good at poetry. I don't like English. I don't even know what that means, but these are the kinds of responses that I would regularly hear from students who would protest reading in the classroom. And it seemed like there was this breakdown. There was this disassociation between great books and literature versus all the things they actually enjoyed, the things they actually love to do. And for me, those were so intimately connected. I started changing the way that I taught so that I can invite them back into a love for reading because I do believe that reading, we're called the people of the book, the Christians are, whether you're Orthodox or Catholic or even actually Jewish, we're people of the book. And so I believe reading can direct us towards the love of the God who revealed himself in the book of nature and in the book of Revelation. And that should be our starting point and our foundation. But how we read is going to matter as much as what we read. So I've talked a lot in the past about what we're reading, whether I'm teaching Brothers Karamazov or Dante, but how do you read? If you notice when you're reading scripture, Jesus is constantly asking the fairy, Pharisees like, have you not read? Have you not read? And, and at one point, even a religious teacher comes up to him and, you know, asks like, what's the greatest commandment? And um, Jesus says, how do you read it? How do you read the text? So there seems to be a disconnect between these Pharisees and religious teachers who have studied the law. They know the text. They know the Old Testament so well, and they don't recognize the logos when he's standing in front of them. How has that disconnect happened? How have they read so much of the same words that he read, and yet he is the embodiment of it, the fulfillment of it, and they can't see it? I think that if we're going to learn to read in such a way that we recognize Christ, we have to practice different reading strategies than the ones that the world's given us or that some of our poor classrooms have given us or some of the methods maybe of utility, efficiency, getting the right answers. Some of these methods that are not taught by the scriptures themselves for how to read them. Jesus actually teaches us how to read. So I'm going to start with the Bible because I think it's really important. And the one that I'm going to just read a small passage today, but the passage I want to use is a parable in which Jesus also explains why he tells parables and then also unpacks the parable. And this takes place in Matthew 13. So a lot of people are very familiar with the story in scripture, and I'm going to use a different translation 
because my hope is to defamiliarize you with something you think you know in the hopes of inviting it back fresh that we can have new insights with something that that feels very close to us and very comfortable to us that it can make us uncomfortable and hopefully invite new revelation. So in Matthew 13, Eugene Peterson translates it a little differently than most of our NIV, RSV, CEBs, whatever other translations you use. And I believe that Peterson's doing this on purpose. If you read his book called Eat This Book, which is on Lectio Divina, on one of the ways of spiritual reading, he explains his process of translation, that he was trying to get the words to sound alive again. And that's what the scriptures are doing, right? They're supposed to be living words. And too often, we kind of, the way Walker Percy says, we wear off the edges of the words like a well-worn poker chip. And instead, what Peterson does in the way that he translates the Bible is he gives it that edge again. So listen to this. Jesus relates this parable. You're all familiar with it. Someone scatters seeds. They fall on a road. They get eaten by birds. <laughs> they fall in the gravel, put down no roots. They're in the weeds and then they're strangled. And then some fall on good earth and produce a full harvest. And when Jesus tells us, then he says in Peterson's translation, are you listening? Really listening? Wow. Like, why would he ask that? Right. He's doing the same thing to us. If we put ourselves in the place of the disciple, did, did we just hear that story? Why is it important? And the disciples respond instead of saying like, yeah, of course we are. Jesus, we're listening. They respond with their own question. They say, Jesus, why do you tell stories? Oh, it's such a challenge, right? So here he's saying, are you really listening? And instead of them responding with, yes, we are definitely. Um, in some ways, I think they're admitting, no, we're not because we don't get what you're doing. Why are you telling a story? Jesus replies, and I'm going to read this rather lengthy quote because it's the heart of what I hope to do in my book is imitate Jesus here. Just, you know, a bold, bold claim that I'm about to make, but Jesus replied, you've been given insight into God's kingdom. Not everyone has this gift. It's been given to you. Whenever someone has a heart ready for this, the insights flow freely. But if there is no readiness, any trace of receptivity disappears. That's why I tell stories to create readiness, to nudge people toward a welcome awakening in the present state. They can stare until doomsday and not see it. Listen till they're blue in the face and not get it. I don't want Isaiah's forecast repeated all over again. Your ears are open, but you don't hear a thing. Your eyes are awake, but you don't see a thing. The people are stupid. They stick their fingers in their ears so they won't have to listen. They screw their eyes shut so they won't have to look. And so they won't have to deal with me face to face and let me heal them. But you disciples have God-blessed eyes that see God-blessed ears that here. So here we get Jesus explaining why it is literature is important. It is to create a readiness and nudge people toward a welcome awakening that they will no longer have stopped up ears and stopped up eyes, but they will have God blessed eyes and God blessed ears. Isn't that a beautiful promise that he's trying to show us the necessity of stories, the necessity of poetry in our lives to create that kind of readiness. And of course, it begins and ends in Revelation. It begins in scripture and hopefully ends in the beatific vision. But literature then becomes a resource that continually stirs us to that place of understanding, this welcome awakening that we're supposed to have. It's supposed to nudge us into readiness. And Jesus shows us how to do this. He actually walks through the parable and he gives both a literal interpretation of the parable and then a figurative interpretation of the parable. Now, this is a way of reading in the Christian tradition that was really popular pre-1500. And somewhere between 14 and 1500, there's a lot of reasons why it loses traction. And we start to decide between those ways of reading, either we're going to be literalist or we're going to be figurative spiritual readers. And I think we need to see again, the intimate connection between these things. I would also argue that that intimate connection can be broadened out to our ways of reading literature. So let me start first with the ways that he explains it with this parable in particular, and then talk about why I think we can apply this more broadly to literal and figurative readings of literature. 
So Jesus explains the farmer who sows the seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The pure seeds are the subject of the kingdom and the thistles are the subject of the devil. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. So he actually takes it to an eschatological reading, which I talk about in my book and how to take things there. But we're not going to do that today because that's a lot and we have a very short amount of time. So just know that I am not missing on what anagogical reading is. I get that there's that sense is actually here, but we're going to we're going to not go to tropological or anagogical. Whew. We're going to stick with just literal and figurative <laughs> for the sake of time. So here he's saying there's this literal story that I just told you. And here's a spiritual way of reading that the farmer also is the son of man, that the field is the world, the seeds are the subject of the kingdom. In a sense, he's opening their eyes to what the Pharisees meant, missed, because the Pharisees were looking for this literal king who is going to rule an empire empirically on earth. And because of their literalist interpretation, they were missing so much of what Isaiah was pointing them to or what Daniel was pointing them to that had spiritual ramifications that Jesus was fulfilling, that he was a spiritual king, which is much bigger than a literal physical king in Palestine at that time, which is not was not going to happen. And so I, I think that this missing element is something we have to gain and curate as we practice reading. An easy way to do this, I'm going to start with Flannery O'Connor. <laughs> you can do this with a lot of people, but Flannery is my jam, so we're going to stick with Flannery. I'm going to give you one example by reading a paragraph from Flannery O'Connor and show you why this works and how to do this and how I think it, it can actually be very fruitful. Now, a lot of people read Flannery and, um, well, there's no lukewarm reactions to Flannery. <laughs> so people either love her like they've been hungering for this kind of challenge and spiritual urgency, or they read her and they think, I have no idea what just happened to me. I don't know that I want to look at that again. Um, you know, it's like looking at roadkill on the side of the road. It's like, you can look and you just don't want to look away, but you know, you should look away. And that's Flannery. That's the experience usually of reading her. I want to suggest that if we practice figurative readings of Flannery, what she would call sacramental or spiritual readings in the same way that we read the scriptures, what we're gaining is practice to be able to read the scriptures again. So it goes back and forth. So scriptures are the authority. They're the beginning and the end. At the same time, we want these literary resources that help nudge us towards this awakening so that we can practice reading in such a way that we get more from the, the scriptures, right? That reading literature, then we return to the scriptures and it's a back and forth process. The Bible helps us read literature. Literature helps us read the Bible. It goes back and forth. So here's a, an example from Flannery. This is from Greenleaf. It's one of my favorite stories by Flannery. I'm going to read a very small passage. Mrs. Mays. That's the first word, right? Mrs. Mays. Technically two, because it looks like Mrs. and then Mays. Mrs. Mays. Now, why would we start a story called Greenleaf with somebody else? Well, one of the things I think Flannery's doing, if we start reading this spiritually, is she is showing this character who, if you read the story, I'm going to start giving some stuff away. But if you read the story, she is a very possessive person. She wants to own everything. It's all about her land and her stuff. And there's a bull on her land that is interrupting her sense of paradise, right? For whatever that's worth. And so she is all about owning and closing herself off. And yet what Flannery shows us in the opening word of the story is that the title has been given to somebody else. There's lots of reason we could go to that, but we won't for the sake of time. And instead, by her being so possessive, She's actually lost agency on the syntactical level and has become only a possessive adjective. Yes, she's the first word in the story, but she's nothing more than a possessive adjective. She's not even the grammatical agent of the sentence, right? It, I mean, it's crazy to me to think that you have that level of spiritual reading that you can take with the text, but you could do this with all of Flannery. And I'll show you a few, a few more ways to do it just with the sentence, but She's taking something and saying, read closely, pay attention, right? Practice that level of attention. Mrs. May's bedroom window. The story opens in a place of vulnerability, right? If I was doing a Socratic discussion right now, I would ask my students like, why the bedroom? What does this mean? Why the window? Look at the transparency that should be there, right? There's a spiritual significance happening 
on just the very small literal level with those words if you look at them and see both senses at play there. So the bedroom window was low and faced the east. There should be bells dinging for anyone who is part of a liturgical tradition that recognizes what is low and faces east, the altar, right? And the church, her window is low and it faces east. And what is on the altar? The very next words, and the bull silvered in the moonlight stood under it. So we have spiritual significance to this literal moment where it's set up like an altar and there's a bull there on the altar. And he stood under it, his head raised as if he listened like some patient God come down to woo her. And suddenly what was just a simile has taken on greater and greater meaning. And he's listening for the stir inside the room. Now, when we first see her, she turns on a lamp and it's this artificial pink light. And she has these green rollers in and this green face paint on. And we see her as this like artificial Medusa character that is interrupting the spiritual beauty of this scene. And then she shuts off the lights and she closes the blinds. And there's a sense of her spiritually closing off, not wanting to see, not wanting to imagine what is in front of her rightly. So that by the end of the story, again, I'm giving it away. So I don't know, plug your ears if you don't want to hear the end of this. But by the very end of the story, when the bull comes after her, we have seen this pattern with this image of the bull taking on greater and greater resonance in the story. It's almost like he's thickening with sacramental import over the course of the story. He gains more and more until he becomes, in a sense, that figure, that God come down to woo her and is coming towards her. And that bounding streak, she doesn't want to see. She's looking straight at it. And it says that she can't see it. And she has the look of a person whose sight has been restored, but finds the light unbearable. It's a beautiful moment. And, and when we think about what's happening with this pattern and the way that this, the symbol is gaining more and more meaning, and then we look back at something and read scripture. Take a seed, for example. Jesus uses a parable about a seed. Think of all the ways that that gains meaning over the course of scripture. Uh, Phil Donnelly has written the, the lost seeds, right, of learning rather than the lost tools of learning. And in the lost seeds, he talks about like the cruciform nature of a seed. He talks about all the agricultural import that we see in the Old Testament given to the seed. So that when Jesus is using this image with his disciples, again, it has gained that weight, that momentum, that significance. And if we read with those eyes, the eyes that we practiced reading with Flannery with a short story, and then we take to scripture, the whole world of scripture opens up and we're able to read more deeply, more closely. Hopefully we're those who now have the God-blessed eyes and the God-blessed ears because of the ways that we practiced reading literature. So my book is an attempt to show people how to do that. I walk through several different reading strategies and practices in, in the hopes of getting people there, right? Moving to, to what we talked about earlier is contemplative ways of being, right? What does it look like to be a contemplative reader? Those who read for the love of God, I would say those are very aligned in their mission. So I'm going to push pause on that. Um, part of the presentation so that I get to hear your questions and hopefully get some time to answer them. And I know that that was probably a little bit like drinking from a water hose, but I hope it was a helpful introduction to the book and, and to what I'm trying to do in the book. And now maybe you can ask me um, how I went about this or, or what other questions you might have about the reading practices. Thank you, Jessica. We do have a couple of questions that came in. I just want to kind of pause for a moment because you're right. Like you've just given us a big <laughs> cheeseburger. <laughs> so I want to yeah. give everyone some time to kind of think and probably we'll have some more questions come in. I, I really love how you started it off with us just talking about how you were going to defamiliarize um, us in term or, or, or the text for us because we're so used to hearing it a certain way. Um, I've never thought about that practice even with my students in the classroom where they come sometimes with apathy for something like you you were talking about that just in the beginning you, you've noticed that with your history as a teacher from lower to to graduate school um could you talk maybe a little bit more about that just 
you know, what are some very um, specific experiences you've had in the classroom doing that and, and what has um, come from that? And, and the reason why I'm asking that is just today in our, our um, coffee that we have with parents, we were talking about education, um, classical Christian education as the recovery of the good. And you mentioned, you know, reading in this way is to create readiness to help the student to be receptive. So I have all these kind of ideas running in my mind. And then when you just a very practical piece, you said of defamiliarizing the text, I was like, oh, maybe that's like a doorway and at any yeah. point when you're trying to recover the good or to help a student be receptive. So I don't know if you could talk more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I usually try to teach in bite-sized chunks. And I think that's one of the easiest ways to break down those barriers, right? To get people to pay close, close attention. So I modeled it a little bit, just kind of showing you a class on Flannery O'Connor. I might spend an hour or so on that paragraph in the beginning. And there's other ways of teaching where you walk in and, and you assume that the students have processed the short story in front of them. And so you say like, what did you guys think? Or um, you know, wasn't that crazy, the ending, or, you know, did you feel like she set you up for that? Or did you really think that Mrs. Greenleaf was a good person or Mrs. May? And, and we can kind of compare and contrast, right? There's, there's this bigger, these bigger questions you can ask. I would say those questions happen later and they happen with people who are excited and prepared for the material. A lot of times with students, the best way to begin is the very close reading of the text because they have gotten so used to just skimming through and not processing words. And if we can get them to slow down and break them apart, suddenly they're going to read differently. I mean, they just will. Um, here's one example from Sunday school. So this is an 80 an something year old woman in my Sunday school class. That's what I mean. I've taught like every single age you can possibly imagine. We're all in the process of learning. So uh, she was 80 years old and I was starting with the opening of Genesis. And I said, all right, let's read it word by word. What does God do? Just in the first line of Genesis, what does God do? And you notice there's three verbs in the opening of Genesis, right? God created, God hovered, God said. Now that's what I wanted to get to, but because she had familiarized herself so much, she's like, God creates order out of disorder. And I'm like, oh, okay, yes. But like, that is a huge paraphrase, right? That's a big response. Like, let's look closely. What does it mean? Because later we're going to be created in his image. So what can we learn if we say God created, God hovered over the waters, God spoke and it came to be, you know, what, what do we learn about our calling and our vocation? If we start reading it more closely, if we start unpacking every word. So I would say for students, some of the, the best ways to start getting them involved is is zoom in, go close, go slow. And it is not a waste of time. If, I mean, I've spent, I spent an entire class period on the opening front matter of Vonnegut Slaughterhouse Five. I mean, I don't think we didn't even get to the first page <laughs> that text. I think that that's a really good practice for students and for them defamiliarizing and also just changing their paradigm of what, what's the purpose of reading and how to read, right? Um, instead of just trying to swallow the whole story or answer these big quizzes, getting them to slow down and, and love paying attention to each word. I love that. I mean, just kind of the, the other questions that I had that I think you responded to, and that is, you know, how are you getting them ready or how are you awakening them? And I mean, what you just described is that contemplative restful approach. And um, I know not every, I mean, whether it's a homeschool or a classroom, we have practical demands on, on the schedule, but to find ways to, I mean, just spend an hour on a paragraph, I think is amazing and, and a worth, and, and not to be skipped over for the sake of a, a calendar or pacing or whatever. Um, yeah, I'd highly recommend it. I think sometimes the, the system is a totalitarian God, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I think we really have to break out of that way of being. If if what we're trying to do is apprentice students in a great tradition that's going to lead toward them loving God and being his saints, that's got to have a whole different paradigm for teaching, right? It just has to. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that would be my intention. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's take some questions from our audience. Um, 
this one in the Q&A here, um, with life so short and so many books to read, how do you split your time between classics and contemporary books? Um, do you have suggestions for allocating your time? And then Michael McDonald just wants to say, by the way, Scandal of Holiness was mind boggling. Great. Thanks for all your work. <laughs> I really, that is a great, that's a great compliment. Um, thank you. Yeah. I, so I do go back and forth a lot. It helps that my day job is teaching the classics. <laughs> so I, you know, I really don't have a choice. I, I basically run through everything from Plato and Epic of Gilgamesh all the way to um, Flannery O'Connor and Percy. So, so for me, that ends up being my day job. I will say that I start missing older books if I don't have them. And I am much more desirous to read old books. Like even, even if it's just 20th century, even if it's like 1930s or sixties or something, I love getting out of my own place too often. Contemporary reads for me, they're so influenced by where I am now that they're just showing me the same water I'm already swimming in. And I love taking a step back and be like, how did we get here? And how did other people <laughs> think about things? So I, I have a preference for old books. Uh, Walker, uh, sorry, um, C.S. Lewis, he talks about like the read three old books for every new book you read. And I think that's a, probably a good ratio that I follow in my own life. I do read contemporary fiction. I do read contemporary theology and um and books that are coming out right now, but that's probably the ratio that I use as like a three to one ratio. So. Thank you. Um, Barbara Hammond, she's asking, do you have suggestions on books you've written or ancient Greek literature? Um, mm. I don't know what she's asking is a, is a whole other world, she said. So okay. maybe some suggestions on, on the ancient Greek literature. Yeah. So most of the defenses for reading spiritually, this is, it probably sounds strange for us, but um, pre 1300s, most of the defense has to do with ancient literature. Oh, I mean, I would say all the way up to Philip Melanchthon, right? It's, um, you know, 1400s and so forth. People are saying, read Homer, read Virgil, read Ovid. You have an entire tradition going that direction. So when people are talking about reading old books, that's what they were talking about in the church, the defense of Homer and so forth. Now I have a YouTube channel that happens by Providence because when quarantine happened, I had to start putting all of my lectures online for how, you know, how I was going to teach these books. So I was teaching Brothers K and T.S. Eliot. And um, I also ended up teaching Homer and um, the Aeneid online. And then I ended up doing an entire Inklings course online and a Flannery O'Connor collection online. So I just started putting more and more videos out there that are about they're like 15 minute introductions to like book by book going walking through the Iliad or something. So that's one of the things that I um that I would say is a is a resource. So not necessarily something I've written on those texts, but a resource for how to walk through them either by yourself or with students. You might um touch on this only because I'm I'm not familiar with an, any of those lectures you have on YouTube, but now I am super curious. So I'll be going there. But another qu question a mom has asked here, um, why ought Christians to read stories that seem antithetical to Christianity, like mythology, Greek plays, um, our school, and I imagine maybe other K to 12 type schools, that is a common question we get. Um, why read Oedipus Rex? Um, how, how do you kind of respond to that? Yeah. So I think um, ba St. Basil has this great essay. You can actually Google it online. It's called To the Young Men, because of course those would have been the only students that St. Basil was writing to in the fourth century, but to the young men about learning. And in this essay, he says, reading all of these great myths that were pagan is travel supplies for eternity. I love that phrase. <laughs> so he says, everything that aligns with the Bible, take with you as a wonderful piece of baggage, a piece of luggage that helps you on your journey. Um, everything that doesn't align with the Bible, leave behind you and keep walking on the road. Now, St. Augustine has a similar analogy with um, the Israelites leaving Egypt and taking with them the Egyptian gold. So the things of the pagan, and then later those that theft that God deemed appropriate, right? Take all this Egyptian gold they then turn into the altars when they're building the temple. And so the things that are belonging to God 
right? His truth is found in pagan literature. His truth was being spread by the Holy Spirit. We have to still find it, recover it, but then give it back to him as his altars, give it back to, to him as travel supplies for eternity for his church. And so when we are looking at these old myths, you know, Louis Marcos responds, they knew up to a certain point, And then we see the full revelation in the same way that the Hebrews knew up to a certain point, And then we see the full revelation. I would say Greek literature and the old Testament kind of share that, mm -hmm. um, share that way of receiving partial and then receive fully, right. Once you put it all together and put the whole story together. Thank you. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and um, ask you something about the book. So of course it came to my desk just today. So um, around four o'clock, I was jumping into it. And one of the sections that I love, you were talking about making book choices um, and thinking about those book choices, kind of like your friends. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the books certainly it's contemporary fiction, but a book that I've read and reread recently, um, My Name is Asher Love. And the mom in that book is a minor character, obviously, but listening to you tonight and thinking about how um, just kind of what that level of attention can do in reading a book, I was thinking I wanted to go back and reread that book to see the mom more clearly and and to uh, because I don't want to give it away but if you read the book at the end his final masterpiece of work reflects his mother I wept in that book because and when I read it before I mean I clearly was not even married at the time when I read it I didn't have that reaction but being married, being a wife, having children and reading it again, I was like sobbing at the end. And so when I was reading this, that was the book that popped into my mind, like those friends that I want to get to know um, better or to spend more time with. So I was wondering, um, I just kind of gave you one of my examples, but other books um, or characters that spoke to you in that way or your students where that friendship was started and it led to maybe in my case, I think, you know, when you read My Name is Asher Love, there's so much there to learn about suffering, um, family, I mean, so many dynamics there, but I was just wondering if maybe you could speak to, um, and forgive me, because, you know, I haven't read this book yet, but just what else you say about book selections and thinking about how these um, stories become our friends or even specific characters become our friends and how that drives this, um, this readiness and, and this receptivity. Yeah. So I do go through the process of, of how to select great books or what makes a great book, because that's a big question for a lot of people. So the simple answer is just kind of, this is just one of the ways is to go through truth, goodness, and beauty with the text. Does the book tell the truth? And by this, I don't mean, does it tell the truth? And it's not a fantasy, you know, Lord of the Rings is truer than empirical truth. <laughs> so when I'm talking about, does it tell the truth? does it tell the truth about way human beings actually are in the world? When people always ask me what I let my kids read or how I choose books for my children, books that have curse words, books that have propaganda with certain characters or viewpoints or worldliness, that, that stuff is so small to me and easy to discern, easy to see through. It's just rather transparent and weak. But the stuff that is scary are the books that tell them they can be anything that they want to be that they are autonomous individuals, that they don't need anybody else's assistance. They don't need anyone else's help. Things that sound partially true, but they're just lies. And when I look at text, I'm looking for books that don't lie to me about what human beings are, what the world is like, who God is. And, and that's, that's the kind of work that I'm drawn to is they have to tell the truth first. I'm also drawn to works that are beautiful. And this is why the great books are so strong because they've been beautiful over time. And so much of our ability to discern what is beautiful has been lost or desensitized by ugliness in the world. And by the longer you know time we've spent in the world and we have to really practice being able to see what is beautiful. So some of it has to be authority and trust 
that some of these things that that are beautiful remain beautiful. And if we've lost our ability to see their beauty by reading them more, we are going to gain a better sense of what is beautiful. We're going to get our taste back, right? We're going to develop our palate. And I think that has to happen because we may not recognize the beauty of Augustine's confessions when we're 18. And so we have to develop that palate (laughs) so that we can see it clearly. And then finally, you know, is it good when you're asking this question, um, Mark Edmondson, who's not a believer, he says that the the way you can tell a good book is, can you live it? I think what he means by that is, is it good, right? Do you change how you live? How shall now I live after I have read this book? How do you answer that question? And if the book can be lived out, right? If there's that level of goodness, as you said, you want to go back and read it. You desire different things, right? It expanded your way of understanding what it means to be a mom, what it means, you know, to be a wife, to be someone in the world who wants those kinds of friendship. I think that's the test of goodness. And we recognize it when we see it. So when I imagine how we pick the kinds of books we pick, those are the questions that we should be asking. When you first start a book, you may not know that. C.S. Lewis says, um, you should always start hoping that the author is going to say something good. And you may realize that they didn't deserve that compliment. (laughs) But at the same time, you start with that. You don't start with a skepticism that they're not going to say anything worthwhile, or you won't be surprised to find they say nothing worthwhile, right? We have to change our receptivity to the work itself as we go through that process and ask those big questions. Thank you. Um, One other question that I had, and then I'll take it back to the audience or if Christy has a question, but um, so I know just from kind of following some of your other articles that you've written, um, a diverse perspective, um, it's important to bring that into literature study. And I know that you have um, a chapter here on reading like Frederick Douglass Um, And because I haven't read this chapter, um, can you tell me kind of what are um, the nuggets in in this section? What did you mean when you put this together, reading like Frederick Douglass? Yeah, sure. So I have four different bookmarks, reading like Augustine, reading like Julian, reading like Douglass, and reading like Dorothy L. Sayers. And the reason I did that is in the process of writing, I kept getting blocked. Writing a how-to book was more difficult for me than writing The Scandal of Holiness, which was what I've been doing for 20 years, unpacking literature and bringing all of its fruits and its glimpses of heaven, you know, to the surface for people. That was just something I knew how to do really well. Writing how to, I needed to see what it looked like. I mean, it's what I'm arguing in The Scandal of Holiness is that when you see someone living like Jesus, you desire to live like Jesus, right? But here I am doing a how to, Okay, well, then I need to see how to live so that I want that kind of reading life. And that came to me when reading Douglas's biography by David Blight. Uh, and re- like Blight was not pointing out how Douglas read, but as I'm reading it, because I was in the middle of writing this book, I was highlighting mentally how he was reading. And he's upstairs by himself reading the Colombian orator, being like, wow, I have thoughts. I have ideas. Reading opened him up to himself and gave words for the emotions and the ideas that he had that he didn't know how to name. And I thought that's what literature does. It frees us to be able to do that. It gets us, you know, to use Lewis's quote, it gets us out of the prison of ourselves. It gives us those many different eyes by which to see the world. And so as I was seeing it in Douglas's life, I thought, that's what I have to do. I have to show them in several different lives across the world and across time, how this has been true and what this has looked like. So I went through, what did it look like in Augustine's life? What did it look like in Julian's life? What did it look like in Douglas's life? And what did it look like in Sayer's life? So for me, it was just trying to show the different ways of reading as I was telling you how to do it. And so that, so that people could see it in action. So um, one question that I have just in response to that is, and I'm just kind of imagining that that type of reading and research and preparation, and then putting this together, what were some of the um, surprises 
that you experienced for yourself as a reader writing this book? Yeah, so I was in conversation a lot on social media where the pushback was really helpful. I wish I had been in the classroom. I, I did teach a graduate class on like reading and the ways of reading over the tradition. So I got some pushback, which is really helpful because it solidifies and crystallizes ideas for me to be able to see the pushback. Some of the pushback were things like reading doesn't make anybody better. I'm like, who, who says that? I mean, I, I, I know that reading doesn't like make sure you're a perfect person, but the idea that reading doesn't make anybody better. So it was helpful for me in writing this book to hear from people in the real world who had protests against great books, who had protests against why the ideas from the past don't matter, um, why reading the Bible doesn't matter, or vice versa, like why only reading the Bible matters and you don't need to read fiction and fiction is useless and fiction is a waste of time. And um, I even had one person tell me that she said fiction is such a white privileged thing to do. And I thought, that's insane. You know, I'm in the middle of reading Douglas's biography. And if he hadn't have been reading, his liberation wouldn't have happened. <laughs> you know, it's like you could see a direct correlation. So it was helpful for me in the process of writing this book to hear people's thoughts and realize how many assumptions I had about the good of literature. And then to be able to directly speak to those assumptions of other people and hopefully break open people's eyes, right? Um, to get people to see things that, that I think are true about our reading lives or should be true about our reading lives. Thank you. Um, Christy, did you have any other questions or anyone in our audience? We um, are just now at the top of the hour. So I wanna respect everyone's time tonight. Um, Jessica, I definitely want you to have the last word just in terms of what you want to leave us with to think about or a, a question to, to leave us with. Sure. I, I love doing this. I wish we were all in person. I look forward to getting to meet hopefully all of these different people at conferences and in different, but people can write me. Not everyone enjoys responding in a live forum like this. I am Googleable. You can send me emails. I feel like these questions are really important and they go far beyond my book. Um, I am fine with my book being read or not read, but what matters to me is that people themselves are reading towards the love of God. And if I can help in that process, wonderful. And, um, and if not, I, I pray that there's other ways that people get there. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Again, this whole evening has been recorded. So if you're watching it later, this is great. Um, like Jessica said, you can email her, reach out to her. Um, I don't know, Jessica, if you have anything that Christine can put in the chat box in terms of a email or website, um, you can also put anything in the chat box there, Jessica, that we can follow you. Um, well, my website I'll put right there. And also at Wilson is, is the Twitter. The reason I won't put my emails because I don't want bots to write me, but um, <laughs> <laughs> But if you want to go through that process, it'll at least like screen out the bots and, and real people can write me. Yep. That sounds great. Well, thank you so much. And I can't wait to finish reading this. And then I'll probably be one of those people that emails you. As well. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope I see you again as a conference. Yes. I had yep. such a um, joy meeting you um, again. I know we crossed paths in graduate school like 20 yeah. years ago, but the first time we really got to sit down and chat was this past summer. So um, thank you so much for all that you do and um, your work and, and your lectures and everything. They're inspiring. And um, I hope everyone leaves tonight feeling um, edified and kind of rejuvenated with how we are going back to our kitchen table with our children or our classrooms. Um, so thanks again so much, Jessica. And um, we hope to have you back. Amen. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night.